So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the recent war in Ukraine, which is still going on despite a ceasefire. And I'm going to talk about how that war is, was reported by citizen journalists. And really it's about how we know what we know. So how we know what we know. Um, and I'm going to talk about honest sources and dishonest sources. And how sometimes sources who are partial can, can help reveal truth. Um, the war in Ukraine is probably the most important conflict in, in Europe since the end of the Second World War. And some of the most bitterly contested narratives about the war have been worked through by a citizen journalist website called Bellingcat, um, which is run by this person here, um, Elliot Higgins. So Elliot takes material from social media that's been posted online by different communities. So the communities are um, witnesses on the ground, protagonists on both sides of the conflict, um, and material from government sources. And then, then he uses online tools that are freely available, like Google Maps and Facebook, and the Russian version of Facebook, which is called Kontaktia. Um, and then he verifies the information that he's found. Um, I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about this man here, who's a, who's a Russian soldier that we, we now know is called Bato Dombayev. And this is a picture from the battlefield in, in Ukraine. And he's wearing the he's wearing a white armband and a, and a white thing around his leg that Russian soldiers, as we now know, used in, to distinguish themselves in the, in the conflict because everybody's basically wearing ex-Soviet military uniforms. Um, so this guy here, uh, so so Bata Dunbar, he posted a whole load of selfies on Contactia. And, the, and these selfies, it turns out, when geolocated using the metadata and the images that were online, tracked him all the way from his base in, in Mongolia, near, near the, in, in Siberia, near the Mongolian border, all the way through uh, to, the, to eastern Ukraine, to the battlefield. And then, and then Simon, with the help of Bellingcat, geolocated these images and then went and found the exact place and, and stood in the same place that this guy did. So here's, for example, here's uh, Battle Done by a Sightseeing in Moscow, and here's Simon's version. So it's a very good example of old and new media working together to create something that's useful for the used consumer. Um, and for a long time, the Russian government denied that it was sending troops, regular Russian army troops, to assist the separatists in eastern Ukraine to conduct a covert invasion. Um, and Russia spent an awful lot of money on a, on a huge online propaganda war. Uh, which used trolls, online trolls, which they paid, um, and their TV channel, which is RT, used to, which used to be called Russia Today. And the message that these propaganda uh, outfits were, were pushing was that the Russian troops were definitely not there and they were not involved in, in, the, in this covert invasion. So at one point, it was incredibly important to know whether Russia was supplying troops. And really, I suppose that the reason that I'm presenting this here today is that the value of this kind of reporting lies in the connections that all these different communities that I mentioned at the top make. Um, so I want to say something about objectivity and how we know something is objectively true. So according to Dmitry Kiselyov, who, who runs Russia Today, which is the news agency that's affiliated to RT, um, he says that objectivity is outdated. It's an outdated concept. Um, he says it's, it's a myth. But he says objectivity does not exist. There's not one publication in the world that is objective. Is the BBC objective? No. Is CNN objective? No. So, and it's only a very short step from what Mr. Kiselyov is saying um, to claim that truth is, is actually so flexible that it can be whatever you want it to be. And, People like Peter, someone like Peter Pomerantsev is very good about how the Russian government may, creates alternative narratives to explain away what's happening in, in Ukraine. But actually, theorists in the West have also argued for a long time that, that objectivity is, is essentially bogus. So you had Michael Schutzer in the, in the 70s saying that the reporter's job is basically to report something called news, and, then, and the reporter doesn't comment on it or shape its formation. And Gay Touchman also in the 70s describes what she calls the strategic ritual of objectivity. 
Um, so reporters, she says, sidestep responsibility for the different interpretations of a story by simply attributing them correctly and accurately to the sources that they came from. Um, there's a guy called Fisk who says that objectivity is much more problematic. So he says objectivity is authority in disguise. It's basically a power play. It's basically a trick. Um, and Keeble and Reeves in the newspaper handbook uh, say that transparency is actually a much better technique uh, in digital online news gathering, modern news gathering. Because they say that facts always support particular points of view, and the, very, the notion of ob objectivity discourages audience activity and participation because it's presented as something that can't be challenged. So pretty much all, all news these days is published online, and you get hyperlinks, and, you, and, you, and hyperlinks connect you to um, other parts of the story. So uh, objectively, that what either the Ukrainians or the Russians shot down the plane. And which one was it? So Bellicat did a very detailed report. And here's another piece of evidence. So Ukrainian intelligence released the video. This is a still from the video. And they said that this is the same Buk missile launcher, which was filmed on the 18th of July, the day after the plane came down. And it was traveling through the town of Lugansk, which was controlled by the separatists. And it's now got, you can see in a different part of the video, you see it's got three missiles instead of the usual four. But then a local person, oops, sorry, excuse me. So the, the Russian military had a, held a press conference, um, and they said that the Ukrainian video was a fake. And what is this D? It's got a mind of its own. Russian intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been controlled by remotely. Right. So, Russian Russian Foreign Ministry had a press conference, um, and they they said that the this is their this is from their press conference. They said that the billboard, which was in the photo of the, the with the book, showed. The town, this is the, an address from the town of Krasnoyarsk, which was in fact controlled by the Ukrainian military, not by the, the, the separatists at the time. And so that's the town of Krasnoyarsk. But then a local person went back and took a picture of the billboard, and it sh showed something different. It did not have this. And then months later. The disputed part of the hoarding had been turned had been torn off. Then the ABC TV channel, ABC Australia, went back and they found they again went back to the same the same billboard which they located from the, the telegraph poles and various buildings in the in the video. And the whole thing has been the whole advertisement has been removed by this point. Um, so the conclusion from a combination of local people on the ground, women across the road who took the pictures and that did we now know, um, protagonists on both sides, one of which appears to have lied, um, and ABC Australia was that the Russians had faked, had faked evidence. So it's also worth pointing out that under the rules governing international air crash investigations, uh, the Dutch Air Safety Board report, which was published last October, is not allowed to say who fired the missile. Um, but the lead investigator was absolutely clear that the missile did come from the area which was controlled by the separatists, which were backed by Russia. So, uh, just one thing that's worth pointing out is that this way of working tends to flatten out some of the distinctions between witnesses and reporters, and it gives sources an uh, agency that they didn't have before the online world. Um, so some sources, what, what I found when I went to Ukraine was that some sources who moved away from the battlefield um, subcontract reporting to friends and family, and they aggregate material from friends and family in the battlefield, um, which they can't put online because it's dangerous for them. And this can be very useful. So in one, in one case, a local aggregator, uh, now in Kiev, had access to a traffic camera 
um, which was also on the H21 highway, and he filmed the book going past remotely from, he, he got into the data of the traffic camera basically and, and saw that there was the book, the same book, um, driving past. So, uh, another couple, two images, um, the, the guy, oh, that's Russian, the Russians again. So, mm -hmm. Right, two images that this source with the traffic camera posted online a few minutes after the plane went down. This is the first one. So this, um, he said that this shows the smoke plume from the Buk missile that <coughs> hit the plane. And he also published He also published this photograph at the same time. But this one has cables in it, and the sky is a slightly different colour, and it looks like there are more clouds. Um, and Bellingcat said that they wouldn't publish the metadata from the camera because it identified the photographer. There's only one person in that particular town that owns that particular camera, and all the, all the paperwork leads back, the online paperwork leads back to that particular person, who I know his name, um, who, who took the photograph. So one, there was a Dutch guy who was so convinced that Bellingcat and the source had made this up that he flew all the way from the Philippines um, to, to try to pick holes in the story. So he, he actually photographed the exact place that the photograph was, that the, the two smoke trail pictures were taken from. And it, this was the exact balcony that the thing was, the pictures were taken from. And it shows the location, it shows the location <laughs> of all of the, the overhanging cables that the camera had auto-focused on and the, the camera, the, the autofocus had also changed the colour balance of the sky so you get different colour clouds and so on. Um, so by trying to disprove the story he'd accidentally confirmed its authenticity. So to conclude, I've, I've looked at how reconceptualizing transparency and objectivity contributed to reporting the war in Ukraine. And I suppose my, my main conclusion is that transparency might be as close as we can get to true objectivity in the real world. And I also found that truth isn't a consequence of objectivity. And the, and the truth is, is produced by a compromise between honorable and dishonorable motives. And, and the, perhaps it's better just to think of, of transparency as a, not as an end in itself, but as a method. So it, it's, not, it's not a thing, it's a process. And, and finally, in case you didn't notice, I, I also think that traditional journalism has a role to play here, because there are some things that you just can't do online. And sometimes you need to get out on the ground and do some, and do some reporting.